why the managerial estate will fail. Man will always seek strife, he will always seek war. It is in his nature and in the condition of this world that has imprinted itself upon his soul. But to attempt to suppress this in a way in which consigns it to the dire shade of the forgotten, to ignore it, only mutates it into a monstrous energy. Its eventual outburst will be coloured by a darkness, and it will turn the individual into something altogether evil. Man's base nature must be controlled, not by some self-styled managerial class, but by man's own daily perseverance to tread a higher path to the heights of his true potential, to rest calmly within the solace of his own spirit, and to understand of the value of this path above all else, in both this life and all of the lives that shall branch forth from his ensuing actions, and in time, bear the good fruits of right action too. We must cultivate our imagination, strengthen our connections, dispel with unfounded fear, for it is a killer to all that it touches, and fulfil the condition of the soul and the spirit to bring all into balance, and to maintain this balance through diligence of the self's relationship to this world of form, and to that treasure of the spirit which lies both within and beyond. Excellent harmony, beautiful balance, heavenly equanimity, nestled beneath the tranquil cascade of cherry blossoms. That is what we must strive for, a spiritual reawakening and the founding of a new epoch based upon the principles of controlling the entire spectrum of our nature in accordance with balance, reason, and right action. Another promise of liberalism is that it exercises authority by a neutral standard, that it would act as the non-aligned arbiter to mediate on behalf of all groups, fairly, that it would subsequently not be influenced by any one group, that it would simply establish a well-ordered marketplace of economics and ideas. In time, this would result in the creation of a unified and peaceful world system through liberalist-driven globalisation. Naturally, as I write this, that dream is beginning to become a nightmare, and the promise given by liberalism in the Age of Enlightenment has categorically been proven to be utterly false, a facade of socio-political ritualism that is losing all semblance of meaning within our present time. Albeit, one could argue that it is not liberalism anymore, it is uh, liberal authoritarianism. If that irony describes well enough the absolutely ironic system that we find ourselves in. Indeed, the problems posed by pluralism and the resultant flare-up of tribalistic instincts within these multicultural societies, along with geopolitical power blocks, have not been resolved and, in many ways, have actually been heightened by this liberalist push for globalisation and forced integration across all key aspects, economic, demographic, cultural and even legal. As we are beginning to witness with the economic and military rise of the emerging brick power bloc, the ailing managerialist and liberal paradigm has yielded the inverse response to what it was seemingly looking for. It has, through its failed policies and utopian-related short-sightedness, established a geopolitical environment that is far more chaotic than ever, and tribalism or nationalism is on the rise across the entirety of the world. Was this the plan all along, or was this merely a consequence of unfathomable incompetence? I side with the former, of course, I think this is all an agenda, to artificially collapse the West. However, to digress, as we see within this neoliberal managerialist machine operating in the West and elsewhere, there was and is an ideological component that pilots it or rigs it, depending upon one's appetite for polemical phraseology. It is not neutral and has its own twisted moral standard, even if we may argue that it is an egomaniacally nihilistic one. 
Again, I, I discussed this with tracing this all back to the mystery religions and, of course, the, the, the semiotic overtones and the reclaiming of this idea, this ideal that they hold to of a lost paradise, of that lost part of humanity, of the, the, the sort of godhood, the divine or demigod status that they had within ages past in this golden age or this Saturnia Regna. Again, this is what they're attempting to uh, re reformalize, to, to reformulate uh, into, into this new and emerging new world order, right? It's been the goal of every mystery religion, every secret society. Even, for example, masonry. Uh, it speaks quite candidly of that. Masons themselves hold the, those opinions. Uh, of course, the, the sort of uh, higher up ones beyond the Blue Lodges. And, of course, even the, the Masonic manuals state this, that they are attempting to recreate the New Jerusalem or the Ben Salem. As we read from Alistair McIntyre's work, After Virtue, concerning the managerial elite, liberal philosophy abandoned the pursuit of determining metaphysical truth via reason because of a failure to quantify metaphysics through the lens of the liberal notion of reason. Therefore, as McIntyre intimates, it simply swept the irksome problem of metaphysics under the rug and reclarified its objectives. I actually take a, a divergent view from McIntyre there, and of course, he's an academic, so he probably doesn't go into to, to this uh, frame of reference. But I would state that they did not sweep the metaphysics under the rug, they merely sequestered it. They sequestered the power of investigating the metaphysical, of understanding the metaphysical, because that is what it sort of put them, one could say perceptually, above the canvas. They were looking at the painting, right? Uh, while, of course, us with materialist science, we were, you know, the purely physical, we were in the painting looking at the painting as reality. They were looking at the painting from the perception, from the vantage point of, say, the painter, right? the way they were thinking about it. So they could understand everything from that greater point of view, from that meta. And again, that's why they've sequestered this, this knowledge, under the veil of atheism, under the veil of rather, you know, liberalist driven atheism, right? It's, it's all a guise, it's all a ploy to put us off the, the scent, to put us off the, the trail of finding the metaphysical truth that they hold to, right? They're a people of the idea. They're not a people of the book. They're a people of the idea. They determined an idea long, long ago, or they discovered it rather. And this idea allows, it's, it's almost like a, a unified field theory. And it permits them control of psychology, on a collective and even individual uh, basis or interpersonal basis and it also permits them the, the the sort of inspiration for mass technological advancement and also of course they understood about you know the geographical la um, continents right the the land masses of the earth long before we did they were coming to America for, you know, millennia prior to Columbus, right? We have Phoenician and even, uh, funnily enough, block Hebrew, which uh, was only used, this type of block Hebrew that they found in, I believe it was New Mexico, uh, with the, I think it's called the Decalogue stones. They were, that was only used in the, the first century AD, then it fell out of favour. Uh, rather rapidly, actually, after after the first century AD. So therefore, if that's, you know, if the Decalogue stones that uh, use this uh, very um, specific form of, of Hebrew script have been found 
in, in New Mexico, then it tells you that Hebrews were, were over here, that they, they travelled to this land. It probably as well uh, links to the land of Ophir, that, that the land of Ophir to the east, which took three years to get there, according to the Old Testament records, uh, and is where they found monkeys, you know, gold, silver, all that. That, that potentially could be either the Philippines, could be uh, somewhere in Arabia, but that doesn't make sense, <laughs> really, because, you know, um, from Israel to Arabia, or from Canaan to Arabia, it doesn't take three years. Or, of course, it is uh, the Americas. We have Phoenician um, inscriptions as well. We have Celtic Ogham inscriptions too. Funnily enough, the Phoenician inscriptions that were found, I believe, in the northeast of uh, the, the continental United States. So round about Maine or New York, uh, New York State. I, I'll try and find them and I'll, I'll post a picture here. Um, it's stated that w within the inscription, if you translate it, the Phoenician inscription, it uh, essentially um, stakes a claim by this Phoenician maritime corporation on this piece of land, right, that they discovered. So they had all of this, they sequestered all of this knowledge, and just like the metaphysical knowledge, they sequester that too via uh, the championing of atheism. Again, this was done in response to the Enlightenment. So as people yearned for freedom, yearned for knowledge, they had to satiate that, but they also had to maintain their advantage over the rest of the laity or the rest of the, uh, the masses. So again, they had to champion atheism, uh, nihilism, agnosticism as something that was fashionable for the intellectual class. Right. for those yearning for knowledge, for freedom. Continuing on, in lieu of that, it determined that the only moral objective left for it to purpose, or pardon me, to pursue, in the absence of any value placed upon metaphysics, was its inherency to produce efficiency. Indeed, among other things, this is one of the key reasons that managers have since become crucial components to the liberal society. By that token, the liberalist concluded that bureaucratic management ought to lead to efficiency, according to this previously mentioned thread of intellectual development. What is the objective of an organisation? What is its end state or tele uh, teleology after market share has been all but controlled? Are these objectives or end states teleologies inherently worthy and should society be focusing available resources to this? Well, these questions are not necessarily of the concern of the manager, no. All that the manager has set about to do, all that is his very reason for existence, is to make the organisation or institution more efficient. Quote, quote, efficient is a rather vague term and it does not necessarily correlate with higher profits or even higher productivity. But when bureaucracy or managerialism becomes ingrained, then it typically relates to the said bureaucrats or managers becoming far more institutionally indispensable and having more power over that organisation or institution. As we have seen from recent Hollywood dramas, the tactics of greater efficiency carried out by the managers usually leads to thoroughly positive personal outcomes for the managers, but less than positive outcomes for the society or organisation as a whole. Evidently, that is a fact of human nature when mixed with power and an apparent lack of accountability. So what we mean by that is it creates dystopias. The managers in their ivory towers, again, they have this vantage point, they believe that they can see everything and they, can, uh, they have purview over everything like the Tower of Babel, right? They have become gods. It leads to hu a hubristic or Faustian nature taking hold, where they believe they're, they may actually believe they're doing good, right? By, of course, eh, making those difficult decisions, but they also get sort of high off, 
off of making those decisions, from being ruthless, right? It's good for their political image in their subculture of, of potentates or elites. It's good for their social image as well, right? If they look ruthless, if they command dread or, you know, they have a certain degree of gravitas around them from making these tough decisions and being very resolute in it, right? Again, the decision could be a terrible decision, but if you're resolute, if you're, you know, um, if it's a dictum that you have given, a maxim, then people look to you as the authority. They look to you as, you know, the big man on campus. So, again, this is the problem. You, you can't get efficiency when you're dealing with human beings. Not efficiency, um, you know, like a binary efficiency. It, it doesn't work. And of course, efficiency itself, when it's mixed with the human nature, essentially leads to um, the managers or the despot or the chief or, or whoever. They will determine efficiency on their own grounds. And their grounds were pardon me, their grounds will typically result in them uh, judging efficiency by how indispensable they are as perceived by the masses, right? So again, their efficiency is not higher profit or higher productivity or higher happiness in the society. It is their own indispensability within the hierarchy of that society. The protection of their position of power. Right, that this is the problem. This is why you can never have bureaucracy. As soon as you start to get red tape forming, as soon as you start to get the chief of this bureau, right, and then he creates more chiefs and, and so on and so forth, it's it's bloat driven, right? It has the ideolo uh, the pardon me, it has the ideology of a cancer cell. Managerialism does, bureaucracy does. The the ideology of a cancer cell is unlimited growth. Right, which the cancer cell, let's assume that it was sentient, would see as life, right? Just like the managerialist would see their reproduction, right? They're reproducing out within to, within the, the governmental uh, hierarchy within uh, the, the society as a whole through, you know, this, this bureaucratic department here, that bureaucratic department there, until you micromanage everything they see that as efficiency, right? Just as the cancer cell sees its multiplication as life, right? It's not it. <laughs> this is the irony. Uh, the more you attempt to micromanage and, you know, gain efficiency, the more inefficient the system shall become, right? And the more uh, claustrophobic the members, the participants, of that system shall feel, right? Not the bureaucrats, the, the ones who are being ruled by their diktats. So this, again, these are the problems of firstly human society, right? You cannot have bureaucracies. But the problem is if you don't have bureaucracy um, on a state level, when another marauding state or invading state attacks you, you will not have the organisation and logistical capabilities, right, that the managerial, uh, the managers provide to uh, oppose that, that invading force. All warfare is conducted not on military, direct military action, but on logistics. Whoever has the better logistics will have uh, the the will have greater military capabilities, not in term, uh, not just in terms of defence, but in terms of operational depth, in terms of where they can, um, you know, how deep into to enemy territory they can operate, right? And that makes all the difference, because if you, again, it's changed somewhat now within modern warfare, but in ancient warfare, it was very cut and, you know, um, cut and dry and black and white. If you could take the towns and the cities and uh, quickly change the administration or simply, you know, uh, 
current control to to bring the administration into the fold, into your civilizational or imperial fold, then you could um, you could then more easily uh, capitalize upon that gain, that territorial gain, and get the logistical um, gain and capabilities from that city that you have controlled, right? Or from that farmstead, or from you know whatever it may be. Um, so it, again, it's efficiency is adaptation, which a bureaucracy in its nascent stages actually does fairly well, right? Again, when it comes to um, militaristic operations, be it defence or offence. So this is where usually it begins, bureaucracy. That's why you see, for example, a bureaucracy begin to take hold, really take hold after World War One and Two, right? And all of the various wars prior to that. And of course, it really took hold as well after the advent of mass production within society. That massification changed the entire psychology of the West. It really uh, set the precedent for this managerialist class to take hold. Which, of course, it has. I mean, and, and the society on the back of that has become uh, largely atheistical, right? The Enlightenment paved the way, but really, mass production and industrialization really, you know, it, it, it finalized. It was the, the source of a waxy seal that, uh, that concluded. The, the trajectory that say, Western civilization would travel. Efficiency can also relate to the ensuring of the preservation and sustainability of power, which leads us to wonder as to the green related term sustainability. And we see the way in which such power has typically been exercised by the managerialist states on controlling not only the domestic populace, but upon prospective colonial eh, subjects. One way in which this is achieved is through the control of the necessities of life, water, food, social contact and reproduction. In regards to the notion of food, though it is a rather infamous and well-known fact that communism used food and famine as a weapon, what is less well-known is how the neoliberal managerialist regimes of the West utilised food and famine as a way to control their subjects or victims. To begin, the United States, the heartland government, uh, governmental power rather, of managerialism, gained quite the ill repute in its destruction of the natural diet and food source of the plain nations, namely the bison and the decimation of the majority of its population, and through the destruction of this cornerstone of culture and sustenance. Why, uh, pardon me, what was put in its place? At the time, grain was introduced as the heavy substitute which was, arguably, less nutritious, highly addicting due to the transformation of one's gut biome uh, in the migration from fat and protein to primarily carbohydrates. It led to a great propensity of afflictions due to carbohydrates' deleterious effects upon the human body, and it urbanised the indigenous people as they were now reliant upon the agriculture or pardon me, the agricultural and civilizational framework for their heavy grain intake. Moreover, it broke down the self-sufficiency of the indigenous population, which paved the way again for coerced integration into the urban polity of the burgeoning United States and the manifest destiny, which was entwined in, uh, with the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. Therefore, freedom and the expansion of this platitudinous and largely false abstraction of this civilization defining concept resembled, more so than not, a form of urban serfdom where one was stripped of their inherent and unique cultural identity and enslaved by a terrible diet. In the modern era, this was replayed after World War II, this colonial cuisine being a key to colonial or feudal control in the Pacific Islands that fell within the sphere of influence of the United States. For example, the islands in question and their related obesity rates are 
Nauru, 61%, Cook Islands, 55.9%, Palau, 55.3%, Marshall Islands, 52.9%, Tuvalu, 51.6%, Niue, 50%, Tonga, 48.2%, Federated States of Micronesia, 47.3%, Kiribati, 46%, Samoa, 47.3%. The tale of how the US colonised and subordinated these lands by means of frankenfoods and exporting obesity is rather insidious, yet ingenious, as is always the case with schemes of imperial expansion. However, to begin, post-dating the Second World War, the US sought areas where they could remotely and relatively safely detonate nuclear weaponry and test the effects of radioactive material in a post-nuclear event, or so the story goes. This subsequently poisoned a great deal of the marine life and led to the Pacific Islanders, in areas such as Micronesia and the Marshall Islands, to rely heavily on the imported fast food and chemically laden preserved foods of the US, which they had already become familiar with during the war years. Unexpectedly, this led to a precipitous decline of the health and longevity of the islanders, with them being some of the most unhealthy and diseased populations on earth. Now, of course, the islanders are completely dependent upon the US both culturally and to satiate their now fast food addiction, with the US using these fast food mega corporations and the pop culture that is entwined with this consumeristic and blighted lifestyle to project their soft power across the world and to colonise wherever the pathogenic ideas and said lifestyle pervade. Of course, another avenue of this is through drug addiction with the Wuhan laboratory, that one that has become famous in recent years along with the notorious Dr. Anthony Fauci, for synthesising and producing the synthetic opioid of fentanyl, the one that is ravaging through the West at present. This is then illicitly and covertly shipped to Mexico, where the cartels smuggle it to the US. Alternatively, the drugs are also shipped into ports through Vancouver and other ports in Western Canada, where they are then cut or mixed with other uh, drugs to lower the purity. These are typically made into a form of heroin or they are simply pressed into counterfeit prescription pills. From both Canada and Mexico, they are sold through North America and primarily in the US as a way to destabilise and destroy the country. Naturally, due to the artificially high and constricted medical and drug prices in the US, this funnels people down the path of using counterfeit and black market alternatives to proprietary medication that would otherwise be prescribed by a doctor. Upon the purchasing and ingesting of these counterfeit drugs, laced with synthetic opioids, the individual shall become quickly addicted or simply overdose there. Moreover, recreational and typically soft forms of drugs are being nefariously laced with synthetic opioids as well, which may actually kill the user upon their first high from it, depending upon the level of purity of the synthetic opioid still present in the recreational low-end drug after cutting. Needless to say, this is an epidemic and the US federal government is doing jack diddle squat about it. In fact, they seem to be facilitating the trade by protecting the Mexican cartel and Canadian biker gangs and drug gang side. Indeed, this is also the reason why the federal government acted so belligerently to Texas when they decided to call a state of emergency and shut their border down. That being, if the border is shut, then the fentanyl cannot flow freely. Hence, Americans cannot be covertly murdered by the treasonous federal government and their cartel mules who distribute this opioid-derived bioweapon to children, teenagers and vulnerable adults. Naturally, the majority of fentanyl overdoses in the US 
concentrate within the demographic of poor and middle-aged white males, which is ultimately the useless and undesirable class they seek to cull with this precision pharmacological strike. Poor and middle-aged white males have been pushed towards becoming addicted to hard drugs, such as fentanyl, due to the artificially created socio-cultural conditions. It is difficult for a man to gain any upward mobility within this world today due to the economically contextual effects of strangling inflation and the overbearing tax burden, along with the unshakable imbalances that poor socio-economic chances produce in finding a mate amongst the obsessively selective modern female population. As part of demographic replacement or ethnocidal policies, they must eradicate or heavily impair impoverished white males as such reproductive and socio-economic imbalances typically lead to one thing, rebellion. Again, they can't allow this, though it's destabilising and destroying uh, that which they designate as the hostile force, this demographic as I've mentioned, the, the socio-economic and, again, imbalanced reproductive conditions cannot last indefinitely. They can't last long term either, or they will cause rebellion, a total collapse of, of the house of cards, right? Men throughout history have been the sex responsible for the greatest evils, calculated and meticulously planned atrocities, tactically brilliant slaughters, hate-filled rebellions and mass death events. Men are, by and large, if pushed beyond their psychological breaking point, extremely cold, violent, and without the slightest sense of remorse. If a man cannot find a good woman to begin a family with, act as a lifelong companion with and become a good mother to his children or agree to have children in the first place. And this becomes a tangible social norm, meaning it happens to the majority of men within any given uh, either racial, religious or cultural demographic, then one of two things shall occur. One, men shall live a life of singledom where they shall experience a greater than 50% reduction in their outward productivity and taxability due to the lack of purpose within their life as evident by the absence of children and a doting wife, or two, that anger, bitterness and resentment shall lead to the better males, if you will, who lack resources eventually banding together through shared resentment, hatred and bitterness to the society. Again, this is where we get the advent of brigands. And unleashing a violent redistribution of resources aimed at the alpha male hoarders of both women and wealth. This will result in a reign of terror, which will either carve out political agency and territorial gain or merely destabilise and desolate a civilization through an irrepressible destructive outburst. As we see within the West today, Greater than 60% of young men between the ages of 20 and 30 are single and living sexless lives. By contrast, the number of young women who are single is half that rate, which signals that we are moving conclusively into a hypergamous and polyamorous reproductive structure. Such a reproductive structure or culture is not conducive to a stable society, and we shall witness a social and political implosion if these trends are not rectified. Of course, as we have just mentioned, the government seeks to rectify such a situation as by merely preemptively eradicating the future bothersome demographic of white males prior to them reaching that point of critical mass, where an attempt to dislodge the managerial estate and its ruling elite is undertaken. Interestingly, this trend is not merely confined to the West, with China seeing rates of single and sexless young males of a comparative rate to the West. And the problem is, perhaps not the native populations, but you have single men coming into uh, Western and, of course, Eastern countries uh, from the global South. And, of course, there's only so many women to go around. 
There's only so much living, uh, living space. There's only so many resources. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what the hell's going to happen. You know, you're, you're in a pressure cooker. This is pressure cooker conditions, socially speaking. Something will have to give at some point, right? The tension will have to be released. And I'm telling you how the tension will be released in the future. If this social affliction, this social ail, or ill, pardon, is not rectified concordantly. It is not whether we like this state of affairs of hypermonogamy, but it is something that will naturally come about as a response to the decadence and decay produced by this age of miserable strife that masquerades as sophisticated progress. As we all well know, the bitterest medicines are always reserved for the most brutal afflictions. No one is to blame for this age. It was created by radical revolutionaries hell-bent on the destruction of humanity and the restructuring of all life into their own twisted and brutalist vision for some utopian dream. This seems to more closely resemble a dystopian nightmare, albeit. Third wave feminism sought to destroy the nuclear family and weaponize our base nature against us, turning us into common denominator animals who could be more easily moulded and made vulnerable to the growing power of the managerial state. They will fail, their dream will crumble, but we must repeat and internalise this mantra in light of the darkness we have borne witness to. Never again, never again, never again.